Um, <clears throat> you, you may know me from uh, the Wooden Books series. I've got uh, a couple books, Elements of Music and Love, and the Elements of Music is also found inside the Quadrivium uh, edition, one of six authors here. So, um, and in fact, some of the information you will be hearing from me today is in the music book. So, uh, I'd like to present to you, um, or let's say uh, propose, the influence of the harmonic series or the overtone series and what it's had upon Western music. And I'm going to make two claims, and hopefully uh, I, I seek to prove them. One is that the intersection of equal temperament against the just intonation of the overtone series is what is responsible for generating uh, tonality and tonal harmony. So that's number one. Number two, I also aim to demonstrate that in fact, the history of the evolution of harmony in the West has followed that same template or outline as if the overtone series was a, a map of harmonic history itself. So uh, that is what I hope to demonstrate and we'll do some of that with the piano as well. So uh, we'll start here with some visuals for context. Here we are. So, as we likely all know, the uh, audible sound spectrum exists within a very much larger spectrum of uh, electromagnetism, of radiation, of vibration, right? So, we can uh, move in a little closer. This diagram is organized in octaves, and yes, octaves theoretically exist beyond simply uh, in music, but uh, what it really represents is a doubling of frequency, right? So let's have a look here. Get that moving. So way up here at the top, we have uh, gamma rays, radioactivity, um, and also the, the scale of things is quite tiny, very, very small waves. Um, here we have the visible light spectrum that's just gone by there. And quickly, we're going down to radar, uh, 5G, that, that uh, technology we've all been hearing about, uh, microwaves, radio waves, etc. And then here we are in this empty area in the middle without the color. And that is indeed, uh, as you can see by the keyboard there, the range of audible sound, roughly 20 to 20,000 uh, hertz or cycles per second. And that's where we'll be focusing today. There we are. So um, it's important to notice that the nature of pitch when you double the frequency to make octaves is curved, right? It's not a straight line. And that means the distance between two frequencies, an octave apart, is doubling every time we go higher in frequency. So this creates an interesting problem with tuning, but we'll get to that in a moment. Uh, briefly, let's talk about what is the harmonic series. Many of you probably already know, but for those who don't, uh, I'd like to just briefly go over that. So uh, here we have a visualization, and if you can imagine a string, like a guitar string, vibrating in its full length when you've plucked it, uh, that would be the bottom shape right there. And that would be the actual tone you hear, which we call the, the fundamental. Um, an interesting feature of physics and of acoustics is the string will also resolve to vibrate in whole number parts, meaning in halves, thirds, fourths, and fifths, and so on. And so the resulting tones, approximately, are these. Now, again, we're in equal temperament here. We're not in just intonation or, or harmonic uh, temperament. We're not perfectly aligned with these intervals, but we're, we're very close. 
Um, so, but, and I'll show you how close we are. Uh, but this is the idea. So in, in a sense, it's sort of an entropic uh, tendency for these vibrations to resolve themselves to nodes or, or these whole number divisions of the string. Same with a pipe filled with air, a column of air. It does the same thing. Um, this generates the timbre or the color of the tones we hear. It's how we distinguish somebody's voice, the sounds of vowels, uh, and the myriad of uh, instrumental colors. So there again are the tones I've just played for you um, in the whole number ratios. So you can see along the bottom there is uh, essentially it's just a uh, increase uh, by a factor of one, double, triple, quadruple. Along the top, uh, you can see the ratio between each uh, overtone or harmonic. And you can see the numbers are getting smaller and closer together. So I'm going to demonstrate briefly before I explain what you're looking at there. Let's just listen for these overtones and get a sense of how that all works. So I'm going to hold down the low C here. Just lift the damper off the string. Uh, my, my feet are not on the pedal or anything. I can kind of show you that. So what I'm going to do is actually strike the tones. Let's bring those back that you see there. And we're going to test the uh, relative resonance or presence of those overtones in the bottom tone, right? So for example, I'll strike this uh, first octave here. And indeed, you can hear that that tone is contained in the bottom tone. Just to remind you, the bottom tone actually sounds like this. It's an octave lower. And of course, that tone contains the upper tones, that which, which I'll also demonstrate. But so let's, let's try that again. There it is. The next one will be the fifth. It's also there. Uh, another octave. Quite audible. Then we get to the major third. Also present. Let's try it another way. I'll hold down this C major triad, which as you can see is right up there, the fourth, fifth, and sixth tones in that diagram. So I'll just push those down very lightly. And again, all I'm doing is lifting the damper off the string. I'm not striking these three notes, but I am going to strike the C at the bottom. And there's the triad. Can you all hear that? You can also do it the other way. I'll hold down this one tone. Again, just lifting the damper off the string and I'll strike the tri triad briefly. So in fact, you're, you're hearing just this string by way of sympathetic vibration or the, by way of the overtones themselves that are actually present in this tone below. So I hope I've demonstrated that. So here's the problem. So we're going to go up here. Let me get that. There we go. Keep going. So here's where we get into trouble. That seventh, kind of there, right? But not as strong as the other ones. Then we have another octave. That works great. Ninth, that's very strong. Another tenth or third, that's good. And then that one's also not working, the eleventh, right? So in other words, Kind of, but not really. So somehow the seventh and the eleventh don't have the same resonance as the octave, fifth, fourth, major third, minor third. All of those are there, pretty strong, but not the seventh, not the eleventh. So what's going on? 
I always thought my piano was in tune. Well, we, we, we've gotten used to this uh, tempered system that we use, um, but let's look at the problem and uh, various solutions to it. So, we understand now that um, octaves are a doubling of frequency. Likewise, uh, if you look at this diagram here, there are two strategies for calculating these frequencies. So one is the doubling, the seven octaves. If, however, we use the perfect fifth, that first one, two, three, four, five, if we use that interval, which is a very resonant interval, as the foundation for tuning, which in fact we do, and many cultures around the world uh, use fifths uh, as their uh, starting point to tune an instrument. If we use fifths and keep tuning fifths, eventually I'll get to another C. The same as if I use the doubling of frequency approach along the top. However, <clears throat> if we actually calculate these ratios, so these uh, exponential figures, we see there's a small problem. So if we tune 12 pure fifths, each one pure to the previous, uh, when we get to the 12th fifth, as you see there, um, we end up with a number that is ever so slightly higher than the seven octaves figure, which is below. So this is this discrepancy is called the Pythagorean comma. And the comma is the problem in tuning. So what happens is we have a situation a little bit like what you see on the left. There, there is no direct correspondence because of that curvature that we saw earlier to notes across multiple octaves. The higher you go, the pitch will resemble the earlier octaves, but it will still be a little bit sharp. Uh, or if you're going down, it'll be a little bit flat, going the other way. So uh, what the goal of temperament is, is to turn that spiral on the left to a closed usable chromatic system, as you see on the right, the so-called circle of fifths. And so various uh, strategies emerged over the centuries to solve this puzzle. Uh, a lot of those strategies, uh, particularly in the Baroque era, we'll go there, um, were called well-tempered tunings, or it's just a kind of well-temperament. And the idea here is you would favor some keys over others. In other words, some of those fifths would be pure and maybe some would not, or maybe they would borrow from the thirds. In other words, we could, and that's what tempered means, right? You're, you're adjusting, you're, you're, you're in a sense compromising something uh, in order to redistribute that comma, that differential, as you see here. And so various strategies emerged um, and it turns out, you know, the human ear is rather tolerant of intervals that have a bit of a fudge factor, right? We don't mind if the major third is a little bit wide or the minor third is a little bit narrow. Uh, we don't tolerate octaves having any differences. It must be precise. Those absolutely have to be two to one. Uh, the perfect fifths are also somewhat resistant to uh, adjustment, to temperament. But the, you know, thirds and the sixths and other intervals um, are able to tolerate it to some extent. So uh, in the Baroque and classical era, the, uh, a lot of well-tempered tunings were very much in use. And if you look at the works of somebody like Mozart or someone, uh, you'll see that the majority of the keys they ch chose in which to compose their keyboard compositions are always keys that are at the upper area of the circle of fifths here, meaning C, F, G, B flat, D, maybe E flat or A, but you will not find any Mozart sonatas in A flat, E, D flat, F sharp, or B, simply because those keys 
didn't sound very good in a well-tempered tuning. Those are the keys with the, that we borrowed from in order to make the upper keys more pure, more closely in line with the harmonic series. All right. Equal temperament, by contrast, is a curious solution. Somebody along the way said, you know, we, we got the top note there in those fifths, if you remember. Said, you know, those are close enough that we could construe that to be the same tone, and there are indeed 12 distinct tones otherwise. So why don't we try this 12th root of two? And what that means, the two is the octave, and we're going to split it into 12 uh, consistent parts. And that is what the strategy of equal temperament does, exactly that. Um, that actually isn't too bad, as it turns out. And although we don't have a lot of pure intervals in this solution, we are able to close the circle. So it's a very close uh, relationship. <clears throat> I kind of think of it like the calendar and leap year, you know, where, where it's not a perfect circle. It's a, we have 365 days, not 360, right? Um, so there seems to be something similar at work here. Um, so here, as you can see, I have put together um, on the left are the what we call just or the harmonic intervals from the overtone series. And on the right, uh, based on A, concert A, 440 hertz, which is what you hear at the outset of a symphony when they tune, uh, the same notes and their frequency value. And I put them here to compare them. And I want you to notice something mathematically, which, which I've already demonstrated by ear, which is this. You can see that the differential between the octaves and the fifths, for example, the C's, of course, there's no difference. They're the same. Um, the, as we go up, the C's ever so slightly are off, but negligibly. However, the two that I have highlighted there, the B flat and the F sharp, as you can see there, are tremendously off from the uh, natural overtone that you would otherwise get. And so this is an interesting problem. F sharp and B flat. Okay, again, if I'm starting on the note C, here's the seventh and the eleventh, the B flat and the F sharp. So, once again, here is the circle of fifths. And if you take a close look there, um, this is, and if you don't know what this is, this is a diagram of common tones. This, these are the different major keys or scales and how they relate to each other. On the right, we are ascending in fifths. On the left, we are descending in fifths. So it's bilaterally symmetrical. When we ascend, we add sharps. When we descend, we add flats to create the new scale, of which there are 12. Um, but if you look carefully there, I'm not sure if you can see that well, but on the right of C, when we go up a fifth, You'll see a little sharp on that staff there. That is F sharp. And if we go down a fifth, that is B flat. And it's with the alteration of that tone that we can create the new scale. C major, G major. So I noticed this at one point and I thought, hmm, there's that F sharp and B flat, right? Sharp four flat seven. And in fact, that is how you move from one scale to another. If you want to go up a fifth, you raise the fourth scale degree of the key you're in. If you want to go down a fifth, you lower the seventh scale degree of the key you're in. Once again, this is the seventh, this is the B flat, and the F sharp is the fourth or the eleventh. Same thing. And so <clears throat> typically when the overtone series is shown on a music staff, 
the B flat and the F sharp are drawn with these smaller note heads, as you can see here, in order to highlight this discrepancy that, that in fact, those tones don't really fit. They are quite off. However, that has not been problematic because uh, here the B flat and the F sharp. And what I'm suggesting to you is that the impetus for the tonal system results from the intersection of uh, the natural increase of harmonic frequency and the equal tempered solution that that B flat and F sharp, that sharp four flat seven, are these salient tones that propel tonal impetus to move. And this is something that I believe Bach figured out, at least by ear, if not by concept, because uh, most of his music, he adhered very closely to that principle. Um, but that's what's interesting to me, is in fact that this movement is already generated just by running the equal tempered tuning system against the natural harmonic series. So we can take that a step further. So you can see here, there's a blue line there. Hmm. Um, on the right, I have uh, written out a bit of history. The bottom there, it says monophonic chant. Above that, organum early polyphony. So organum is the uh, this parallel movement of octaves and fifths, like an organ. Uh, then the Renaissance there going up above the arrow. So in a sense, what you're looking at here, not even in a sense, what you are actually looking at is a map of history on the right with respect to the development of harmony in the West, which I have correlated to the overtones on the scale. And I suggest to you that in fact, when you look at the music from those time periods, those are the intervals you find, right? So in other words, mon monophonic chant, which we know is definitely gonna be, uh, well, let's get some years on there. Here we go. Uh, fifth century uh, AD and, and certainly I think Greek music as far as we know, was very likely monophonic as well, which means one note at a time. Um, and that went on for a very long time, in fact. And in the medieval era, uh, the birth of polyphony, somewhere around mm, 11 or 1200. And uh, th that's when we then get to the octaves and the fifths, the organum. Uh, then the Renaissance, we introduced the thirds, major and minor which seems to correspond with the secularization of society and uh, enlightenment and things like that. There was a kind of uh, moving away from the stark, empty sound of the fifths and octaves and adding the third, which, which creates that feeling of emotion. Um, then, go back to the large one, uh, the major triad and then the B flat, right? At this smaller tone there, that corresponds to the Baroque era. And that is the period of Bach's life in which uh, the tonal harmony as we currently know it was first uh, revealed, let's say, assembled. Um, and then that moves forward upwards into the classical era. And we have the idea of modulation. the circle of fifths, as you've just heard. Uh, this continues, and into the 19th century, we have the uh, harmonic extensions, the ninths. It's more chromatic, more evolved or complex harmony. And indeed, that is around the time when equal temperament was standardized. Equal temperament itself, as a mathematical solution, has been around uh, much longer. Um, I would say at least the 14th century maybe, but it hadn't really come into any consistent use until um, 19th century, middle of the 19th century, and where pianos began to proliferate. Right, and 
then uh, into the modern era when we start adding these more uh, very chromatic uh, sounds, atonal music. Um, up until I would suggest uh, the end of World War II and where we would also find things like microtones, quarter tones, intervals that are smaller than a half step. So let's look here for a minute. And um, I didn't include those, but of course the partials keep going, right? They don't, we don't stop at the F sharp, but uh, we stop at the F sharp for the purpose of this presentation because uh, the intervals are getting smaller and smaller and the smallest interval we have here, of course, is a half step. Um, so there it is. And so what I'm trying to say is not, not just to sort of line these things up, but if you think about it for a minute, humans listening to the same tones, the same sounds, generation after generation, right? And in a sense, what's happening is, or so I, I believe, the, the corresponding resonance of these overtones are increasingly becoming audible and deployed into the actual music that people would write. Uh, and we kept sort of mining that and, and pulling it out, as it were. So in a sense, you're literally looking at the history of harmony, and it is this structure. And as we went from the past to the present, we increasingly include these tones, almost as if we're, we're unveiling the thing. And another fascinating relationship I discovered here, which is um, you, you may notice that the actual durations of time, in other words, how long these periods are, also correspond to the relative distances of the harmonics themselves. So in what, what, what I'm calling the uh, ancient up to the medieval era here, as you can see, spans uh, at least 900 years and likely more. And that covers our entire octave fifth relationship down below. So quite a lot of time, quite a lot of intervallic distance. Uh, then the Renaissance, still a pretty sizable period of time, but nevertheless, not as long as the preceding periods. That third comes in and we've got a solid 200 years of that. Um, and by extension, sixths, of course, the inversion of a third. Uh, and the Baroque era, a little shorter than the Renaissance period. Again, these years are approximate, but more or less. Although we do tend to end the Baroque era with, with uh, the, the death of Bach, who was 1750. Um, then the classical era you can see there is actually e even shorter, right? It's, it's almost about 70, 75 years roughly. And uh, the periods keep reducing in duration as the distance between the intervals shrinks. Uh, you could say as the relative resonance of those intervals also are reduced in our perceptual field. Because if you go back here again, right, this is our visualization of this phenomenon. Um, but as you would guess, the farther out or the higher up those overtones are, the more inaudible they are. We, we can't really hear those as well. So we're mostly concerned with the ones closer to the bottom. Right, so um, let's get back to where we were. So there's the full picture. And again, this is the thesis that I, I hope to demonstrate that the intersection of natural tuning with the harmonic series with the uh, 12 tone equal tempered solution is the thing that generates tonal harmony um, and maps on to the Western unfold, unfoldment of harmonic practice. Uh, this also is used, of course, in considerations like how to voice harmony, how to orchestrate. Uh, the overtone series is extremely important in, in all musical considerations. 
In other cultures, uh, the, so there are different solutions, right? Equal temperament is not the only solution, nor is it the best solution necessarily. Um, there are trade-offs. So for example, in the uh, Indian Shruti system, there are, uh, there are, how many is it? Sa and Pa, so the, the root and the, uh, and the fifth, right? Corresponding to our system, the Do and So. For them, it's a Sa and Pa. Uh, those notes cannot really endure any transformations, but the other tones, the other uh, five tones, have each three or so possible uh, tunings, shrutis, which are not equal in size. And that allows for roughly 22 uh, different intervals to an octave. So we only have 12 here, right? So the Indian system has 22. They are much more in tune with the overtone series, beautifully, um, quite aligned. The problem However, but this is again classical tradition. I'm not talking about uh, modern popular music, uh, but Indian classical. Um, the problem there is there's no capacity to modulate. There's no chords or chord progression. Everything is a drone. It's one one note or a fifth and an octave and some form of scale. goes on like that, right? It doesn't move, it doesn't go to a different place, it just stays there the whole time. So the trade-off in having a more uh, harmonically uh, synchronized tuning, if you like, with the series, is that we m have a much more difficult time making chords, chord progressions, modulation, which means to change keys, move to other keys. Um, and by contrast, of course, in the West, we, we have the opposite problem. We have that ability to move around. It's much more linear in experience, the harmonic movement. However, we, uh, we're not that well in tune with nature as we could be. So that's kind of the trade-off. And at most, wherever you look, um, in, in whichever music of the world, that's what you find is that they, they tend to lean one way or the other. Um, a lot of the cultures use just intonation. Um, some music, such as uh, the didgeridoo or Tuvan throat singers, they use uh, overtones themselves. They don't, they're not even focusing on the pitches, but they, they went straight to those overtones, and that's what you hear uh, in, in their music. So uh, it's fair to say the overtone series is, is a very uh, influential and important uh, phenomenon. Na it's a natural phenomenon, of course, and we are all... Uh, able to collapse these tones into a singular sound when we hear them, right? When, when I play this note, you're not hearing 11 sounds. I don't assume you are. You can train yourself to hear those uh, distinct overtones, but the ear does what's what we call in mathematics a fast Fourier transform, an FFT, which means it basically assembles those all together to the extent that they fit onto this template. We are somehow uh, adapted to, to this perception. And as I said earlier, this is what is responsible for things like um, vowels, the sound of vowels, and so forth. So once again, um, I, so I personally find this quite fascinating that, that, that an, an, uh, what I want to say, a phenomenon of vibration should somehow be a, a a visual map of harmony across time. I find that quite fascinating. Um, and, and so that is what I wanted to present to you today. And likewise, here we are again in our radiation spectrum. And this is the area of audible sound. Just near the bottom is about 60 hertz. That is uh, electricity, at least here in the US, the, the actual frequency roughly a B flat. So just to give you some context of where we are. And after seeing that microcosm, we can then pull back out, recalling, of course, that as we go higher, there are other domains of frequency and vibration that are there with their own internal correspondences as well, and uh, including the visual light spectrum. Uh, naturally, the, the nature of, of the physics of the waves changes as they get faster. 
Uh, there's a discussion about waves and particles when it comes to light. Light doesn't really need a medium, but sound does in order to propagate. But this is a spectrum, nevertheless. And uh, that's actually it. So uh, I hope I've uh, made the case, and I'd be delighted to take some questions. OK, um, thank you, Jason. Um, I've had a few questions come in. Um, if you would like to uh, add your question uh, to the to, to things I will direct to Jason now, um, please do go ahead and message me in the chat. Um, I'll start with um, the first one that came in. Let's see. Um, so someone has asked, um, can you talk more about the use of the dominant seventh in the Baroque and how that sounds? Yes, sure. Um, so that is, let's, let's look at Bach, because that's really who pulled that together. If you know this piece. That's the dominant seven chord right there. And the sound of that, as you may know from the classical style, it's that. Right, that is the sound that, that we, we call the dominant, the dominant seventh chord. And so in the series, it's, it's actually present in the series, naturally. So is that what the question was, to identify the sound and, and, and to give it, to match it to what we hear? Yeah, okay, good. Yes, I'm getting a thumbs up from the um, person who's asked, yeah, so yeah. thank you. Um, and a couple more sort of you know, questions with the historic bent. Um, the first is, um, do we know what kind of what kind of music Orpheus played on his lyre? Um, we don't, but um, I think most of the scholarship, as, as far as I'm aware, uh, leans toward a what's called a monochord or a you know a mostly a fifths and fourths based sound or drone. Um, and possibly uh, what are called tetrachords, the Greek, uh, what we refer to as the Greek modes, Dorian, Phrygian, Hypodorian, Hypophrygian, Lydian, which were named after the different areas in Greece or tribes. Some of this is outlined in Plato's Republic. Um, so some of the instruments may have been tuned to these monochords or tetrachords, which are four note groups. And they don't correspond precisely to our system here, but but they are, in, in a sense, uh, small steps and large steps. And they have other names like apotome, lima, comma. They're, they're all measurements of, of interval. But we can think about that as half steps and whole steps for the most part. And some of that did get uh, integrated into uh, later Western musical practice. And in fact, we do have what's now called the church modes. And they still have those names, Dorian, Phrygian, Lydian, Mixolydian. Aeolian, Locrian, and Ionian, um, two of which correspond to major and minor. So I don't know, I'm not an expert on, on, on antiquity, Greek antiquity per se, but that's my understanding. Uh, on the lyre or certain um, instruments from that period, there are either going to be uh, tetrachords or monochords, most likely. Um, the next questions, um, I've got two um, that touch on the same subject. So um, given the historical development of music that you've outlined, do you have any thoughts about what comes next? Right. Um, so, I, and I've, yes, I've given a good question. I, I, to me, I feel like this journey has somewhat stalled out around the 40s, right, right after World War II, um, only because the intervals are becoming so small that they lose their musical usefulness. Right. I mean, again, we do have microtonal music out there. There are microtonal guitarists. You can easily find them on, on YouTube. Uh, there are people experimenting, of course, with electronic music, synthesizers, alternate tunings. Twelve tone equal temperament is not the only equal temperament. You can have 17 tone equal temperament or EDO uh, sometimes called. You can find all kinds of different uh, solutions which have progressively smaller intervals. Um, 
to me, what it seems to have happened is that ever since then, we've been in a kind of period of, of uh, rediscovering, you know, we have a lot of uh, neo-romanticism or neoclassicism, we've had minimalism, we've had uh, new complexity on the other side of that, uh, and, and various types of modal harmony, jazz harmony, and so forth. So to me, it seems as if we've, we've not really it doesn't continue because these intervals have gotten so tiny. It seems to me we, we're, we are now exploring new uh, combinatorial strategies, right? Or looking at different styles. I mean, we have such a postmodern pluralism now. So in a sense, uh, it's, it's the cross-pollination uh, cross of, of different strategies that I'm seeing the most. So it, it, it's less and less of a... Uh, singular track, I guess is what I'm trying to say. It seems to be spreading this. It's, it's less vertical, more horizontal. Okay, um, we have another question here from Nina. She asks, is an enharmonic interval part of the natural overtone series? Right, so enharmonics, uh, usually what that means is uh, different spelling for the same note is one way to look at it. So in our system here, uh, if I play A flat, also could be called G sharp, right? A flat, G sharp to our ear on a piano is the same sound. It's the same key. Uh, in other systems, that's not the case. So, and particularly like, again, the Indian Shruti system, if, if they have the lowered uh, six or no, the seventh, let's say a flat seven and the raised sixth will not be the same tone. So the G sharp and A flat are not the same there. Are there N harmonics in the overtone series? Um, yeah, I mean, if you go up high enough, you can find everything, but they're so faint and high that, that to me, that doesn't seem, you know, like we're not hearing that. Uh, you know, we're barely hearing these these eleven that we've got laid out now. So yeah, I think if you go up high enough, you can you know the forty third or the thirty seventh partial or something like that. You can find uh, enharmonic equivalents or or you know differently spelled repetitions of tones from lower octaves. Yeah, but I think they're so they're so high up, and by then the the notes are so close together that that it doesn't really. I don't think we're, I don't think it's part of the conversation at that point. Okay. Um, uh, we have a question from Richard. He asks if they knew about the issue with tuning since at least the 14th century, um, when they started equal temperament, temperament, wouldn't they have known at least mathematically about the overtone series, um, including all the higher partials? Right. Um, so Pythagoras even figured some of this out, right? There's the story of the different lengths of, um, I guess they were metal, and they seem to have these whole number uh, proportions in size, and he was able to uh, distinguish between those sounds and notice their resonance and correlation. Uh, the discovery of the overtone series as a fact of acoustics, hmm. When is that? See, that, that's a science question, really. Uh, Rameau was a, a early Baroque uh, theorist. He talks about it. Zarlino. Um, I'm not, I don't have the exact year, uh, but I think it's, it's probably later than 1400. Um, that, that's, we're still pretty thick into the Renaissance there. Um, so... But I think, you know, if you're looking at testability, how we can discover these sounds, I mean, on, on the one hand, you could just do it with a, with a guitar, right? If you, if you play harmonics on a guitar, you can actually identify and single out those tones. Um, but proving that this is something, this is a fundamental aspect of, of how sound and frequency work, uh, I, I think that comes later when, when we have oscilloscopes and, and means by which to to demonstrate and, and, and prove that those things exist so I don't I don't have the exact dates on that did I answer the question I wasn't I think I might have lost track of that I think so 
Um, let, let us know, Richard. Um, Eleanor asks, um, could you talk more about how the harmonic understanding in Western classical music and Indian classical music relates to our different understandings of nature? Um, do you mean this relates to our different cultural attitudes to nature? I do. Um, and this might be a little off of the topic, but, I, but I'm happy to talk about it because I have I do talk about this in, in other contexts. Um, I think, you know, when, when you listen to the music of a particular culture, it is, I think you can hear um, their zeitgeist, you know, their, how they see themselves and in the world and how they perceive the world and the, the workings of the world. So I would say in the Indian tradition, and I'm not, I can't make these claims as, as a Western guy, but, but from what I understand, and by the way, I did spend three years working with uh, Pandit Chitresh Das and the Chandam School here in San Francisco. He was this extraordinary Katak dancer who went all around the world uh, with a tap dancer named Jason Samuel Smith. And I played in some of these concerts in which we had uh, jazz musicians and Indian classical musicians and the two dancers all on stage together. So I learned a lot during those years, which I'm very grateful for. Um, but what from my feeling is that, you know, you have drone music, right? Music that has this constant, ever present sound. We can call that a sense of unity from which everything flows. And then you have this concept of the raga and the tal or the rag, the rag and tal, which are the um, melody sequence and the rhythmic pattern or sequence, which cycle throughout the composition. And you have this, this overall shape to the thing, which starts with an alap, a slow meditation, introducing the, the melodic elements and gradually moving into a tempo when the tal appears. But the music's very cyclical. So in a sense, this illustrates to me a worldview where everything flows from unity and time is essentially cyclic. I think that's what the music embodies. And I, I, I think that may also describe how, you know, a, a cultural uh, view of, of how one exists in the world. And if you look at the West, by contrast, uh, I think we're a lot more linear, right? There's a beginning, middle, end. There's, there's a narrative arc, right? We're not that cyclic. We, we like, we like, transformation we, we like going different places and moving around and into story right and so and and there's the binary of like silence rests sound and no sound indian music has no rests there's no silence in this music it doesn't stop suddenly until it's over and even then it just sort of you know gradually relaxes so yeah i think that to me, I, you can hear two very distinct approaches. So Western harmony has modulation and chord progressions, because in a sense, uh, you know, our fundamental worldview is uh, the space is zeros and we're a bunch of ones filling it up and everything is a story with a beginning, middle, end. And in the uh, Indian tradition, it's more where uh, everything flows from unity, from one, from a source and is essentially uh, cyclic in nature, almost, you might say, eternal, right? Because it's that same, the cycle itself is always there. So it's not linear, right? That's a different, uh, different worldview entirely. Thank you. Um, and here's another great question. Um, for those of us who are less familiar with music could you play some of the different modes for us so we can hear the difference between us between them and, and maybe explain what we're hearing in the differences sure sure um <clears throat> so the modes in, in their modern use are essentially so we all know major right and then we all know probably minor and there are a few types of minor we adjust for the tonal system. So modes, there's there's pre-tonal modal music and post-tonal modal music. So pre-tonal means uh, the Renaissance in particular, and then tonality in the Baroque, and then modal music has, has returned in a sense in the 20th century and in jazz and so forth. So I'll just give you a little taste. The You can conceptualize modes as in two ways. One is as derivations 
from major. So if I take that scale, if I move it up a step, the same notes, but I change where I start and end. So that, that's a mode, that's the, what's called Dorian. Phrygian, move up again. Lydian. Mixolydian. Aeolian, which resembles our minor in tonal harmony. And then Locrian, which has this lower fifth, which is a tritone, so not a very useful scale, perhaps. Um, so that's one way to conceptualize the modes, where, where you have sort of a parent scale, and then you have the, you can say that these children scales, where you derive by moving, shifting up a step. I think the more useful way to think of modes is to compare them to a parallel major scale. So, because we, we all know what major sounds like, I think, right? So what's Dorian? Well, Dorian is a major, except we lower the third and the seventh. We have certain maybe cultural associations with that scale uh, or, or harmonic movements from it. So uh, Lydian is major, but you raise the fourth. Mix a Lydian, lower the seventh. Uh, Aeolian, the third, the sixth, the seventh are lowered. so forth. So there are, those are two ways to think about modes, either in this relativistic way by shifting the tones up and down, or in this uh, parallel way where you compare it to a major scale and look at what's different, which, which scale degrees are altered, sharp or flat. Um, so we have four minutes till eight o'clock. I think we have time for about one or two questions. Um, Let's see. That was a good one. Okay, yes. Um, so Elsie asks, uh, Charpentier in Baroque in the Baroque period wrote that different keys have different characteristics. What tuning would he have been using? Well-tempered, for sure. That's exactly right. And I, I believe because it, that would, that's literally true. In other words, the intervals in any well-tempered tuning, whether there's Werkmeister, there's Kernberger, Velotti, Young, there were, there were a big uh, cadre of these uh, theorists and some composers and tuners who were exploring all these different types of well-tempered tunings. And indeed, they very much result in having, uh, imbuing a kind of different character or personality. I couldn't tell you which of those well-tempered tunings, uh, I, but I definitely would say it is a well-tempered tuning. What's interesting to me is, so, you know, C major is usually the first tuned scale in those days. Um, so that would have been the most in tune. And then as you move outward on that circle of fifths, the keys would become progressively less in tune, more out of tune. Um, with equal temperament, we sort of wipe all that out, right? However, I absolutely believe we, we've carried that forward. And, and this is maybe not responsive, but I want, but it gives me an opportunity to add some info. Uh, I do think we still have these associations with the scales, even though we've sort of rubbed out all those differences with equal temperament. Uh, we tend to associate, to me, maybe we don't all have perfect pitch or whatever, uh, but C major still tends to communicate something about a, a fundamental basic condition. Maybe it's childlike, or maybe it's just, something very direct, you know? The key itself somehow embodies this, this quality. Um, and historically, it's been around a long time. It's been in use for many centuries. Uh, by contrast, keys like D flat, uh, which you really don't find in, in any great use until Chopin list, you know, ninth, the 19th century, uh, when, these, when pianos were a bit more uh, resonant sustained pedal lasted longer. 
um, and the equal temper tuning was standardized. So th there you get much more uh, rich and chromatic harmony, more emotional uh, music, and, and you tend to find uh, pieces in those keys of that type. In other words, th that those keys have not been around as long, and so there might be some, how can we say, a kind of uh, historical resonance of the literature, of all the music ever written in any key, that has, you know, that we've somehow inherited epigenetically or, or what have you, or just to the extent you've listened to any music from those periods. Um, so we, I think we still have those associations with those keys. Yeah, I certainly do. Um, I, I also have some synesthesia, so I have a, a sense of color with, with each key, and they are different to me. Um, they, all, they also fall on the ear differently, right? I mean, C is here. F sharp is here. I can never make those F sharps just literally a tritone away. They, I can't make those occupy the same sonic space on my ear. So I don't know who Charpentier, if that's his name, um, was which tuning he might have been referring to, but I, can, I would definitely say it was a well-tempered tuning. That, that would be an a absolute uh, definite but I wouldn't know which one. Um, but well-tempered tunings result in these different uh, personalities, that each key has a, has a different character and a different flavor uh, due to these differentials of the tuning and, and uh, how they relate to equal, uh, the overtone series. Okay, thank you so much. Um, that has actually ended up very neatly. It's taken up us up to uh, 8 ah. p.m. in London, um, which is the um, end of our... Um, time together. Um, I just want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, thank you for your time and your marvelous questions. Um, and thank you very much to Jason for joining us and sharing the um, the depth and breadth of what he um, has known has known and learned and has thought about the topic. Great. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here, um, and I, I hope you enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thanks for having me.